Good morning. Wherever you're joining us this morning, the congregation of St. Nicholas Church here in Presswick extend a very warm welcome to you. One announcement, the service of thanksgiving for the life of Mrs. Betty Heath will be held here in the church tomorrow, Monday the 8th at 12.30, followed by the committal at Troon Cemetery at 1.30 p.m. We remember Rosie, Geoffrey, and all the family in our prayers today. It was on this date, the 7th of March, 113 years ago, that the foundation stone of this splendid building was laid. And since 1908, here folk have sought and found the loving God. So if you come this morning, slightly frayed by the living of these days, if you come with a hidden sorrow, a private wound, a searing loss, if you come with anxiety about tomorrow, concern for a loved one, this time and this holy space is for you. If you're lonely, confused, afraid, this time and space is for you. Wherever you are, however you're feeling, the intriguing presence of the living God is with you. He hears your story now. He knows your need. He touches your life and warms you in his embrace. Let us worship God. The hymn CH3 489, part of the metrical Psalm 122, I joyed when to the house of God, go up, they said to me. Let us pray. The notes of the organ are so beautiful, Lord, soaring into the dimly lit vaulted roof of this house of prayer. The music floats pure and free, and hearts are moved and grateful, thankful for the calm, the reassurance, the peace it brings. Here within these walls, fashioned by hands long since folded in death, we come to encounter the divine. This place transports us beyond the world of time and space, for here we catch a glimpse of eternity. The shafts of the winter sun penetrate the colors of the windows and soothe our fretted spirits. Ancient words come alive and fill us with hope and comfort, forgiveness and challenge. We quieten ourselves in the midst of our frenetic world and we wait upon you now, relying upon your promise, be still and know that I am God. In a day when so many folks are disaffected by the church, forgive us for making our faith so unattractive, 
for immersing ourselves in unimportant matters instead of focusing on being the community of love and welcome, for being so tied up with our wants, our own desires, that we've neglected a society around us so battered and bleeding. Lord, have mercy. The heaven of heavens cannot contain you, O God, yet you dwell in the hearts of those who love you and in holy spaces set apart. Come now in the power of your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with the burning love of Jesus, that our hearts may beat to the rhythm of his, that each of us may be inspired until the earth is filled with your glory as the waters cover the sea. And to you, the one true God, three in one and one in three, be ascribed all majesty and authority, now and forevermore. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel, as recorded in the Gospel of St. John, there in chapter 2, and reading from verse 13. St. John, chapter 2, at verse 13. Hear the word of God. As it was near the time of the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple precincts, he found the dealers in cattle, sheep, and pigeons, and the money changers seated at their tables. He made a whip of cords and drove them out of the temple, sheep, cattle, and all. He upset the tables of the money changers, scattering their coins. Then he turned on the dealers and, and pigeons, Take them out of here, he said. Do not turn my father's house into a market. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews challenged Jesus. What sign can you show to justify your action? Destroy this temple, Jesus replied, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it up again in three days? But the temple he was speaking of was his body. After his resurrection, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Spirit of life and light, refresh us now with your mercy that the ancient words of Scripture may speak to us, affirming us in our supreme faith in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. As I listened to the national and international news reports this past week, some words of Shakespeare sprang to mind. Something is rotten in Denmark. You ever felt that? that our world has such a disgusting stench hanging over it just now, and I'm not just talking about the stench of pandemic. Now, Shakespeare may have captured the essence of the human condition in that one phrase, those words uttered by the guard in the play Hamlet, the guard who sees the king's ghost walk over the castle walls. Something is rotten in Denmark. Indeed, not only in Denmark, in Myanmar, in Hong Kong, in the United States, in Iran, in Saudi, rotten in the UK, in our suburbs and in our cities, in our churches, and indeed in the temple in which Jesus fashions a whip out of cords to drive out the cattle and the sheep, the doves and the pigeons and the money changers. And we read, he drove them all out. Jesus saw full well that that is the very sense of things which must be turned upside down in order to see the truth, the political truth, the economic truth, the societal truth, and the spiritual truth. That day long ago when Jesus and his disciples stood looking down the broad courtyard of huge stone arches, that magnificent building set above the Kedron Valley in Jerusalem, they were looking at one of the greatest wonders of the ancient world. The temple in Jerusalem was a building of surpassing glory. Surrounding the royal porch were three rows of Corinthian columns, 25 feet tall, carved out of single blocks of pure white marble. 
The exterior walls of the temple were sheathed in gold. They say that if you were looking at the temple as the sun rose, you had to turn your eyes away because such was the glare, the brilliance, that it looked as if the very building was on fire. And it's small wonder that the disciples, who are more or less country bumpkins, exclaimed in wonder, Rabbi, such beauty, such amazing stones. And to which Jesus replied, you know, this will all pass away. I tell you the time is coming when not one stone will be left, in, left standing upon another. And indeed, those words of Jesus came true when the, when the temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And the only part left standing today, and you can see it if you go to Jerusalem, is the western wall, that part that we know as the Wailing Wall. It makes us wonder two millennia later, what Jesus saw when he looked at that impressive place of Jewish worship long ago. The temple in Jerusalem was built during his own lifetime. His father, Joseph, being of course a village carpenter, a stonemason, he may well have been conscripted, along with thousands of his countrymen, to work on this massive project. He would have also known the cruel burden of taxation levied on the backs of ordinary people, folks who were already struggling to survive. Jesus would have understood full well that the temple was designed to control the way in which society at that time operated to create and defend privilege. You only had to look at the way in which the temple had been designed to see how it was defined by walls. The walls that dictated who had access to God of Israel and who didn't. Walls between Jews and Gentiles, walls separating men and women, walls to define the special access reserved for the clergy, and at the very centre of the temple there was the Holy of Holies, that place which only the high priest could enter, and only could do that once a year on the Day of Atonement. The closer you came to God, the fewer were included, is what the temple shouted. And ironically, very ironically, when the high priest entered that sacred space, the Holy of Holies was completely empty. The Ark of the Covenant, which had contained the two tablets of stone, which Moses had brought back down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant had disappeared hundreds of years earlier. And according to St. John, and all the Gospel writers tell this incident, what caught Jesus' attention was that the fact that the temple dedicated to God, had become a vast marketplace. It was a large shopping mall where greedy merchants were taking advantage of vulnerable people to line their own pockets. And they did this because they could. And they could because they and their friends had written the rules, which were specifically designed to make that possible. Their greedy behavior directly contradicted the very purpose for which the temple had supposedly been built. And in a scene of very worthy of an Old Testament prophet, Jesus makes a whip of cords. Now, I wonder if I'm the only one with an Indiana Jones image going through their mind right now. And he uses the whip to drive out the sheep and the cattle, as well as the merchants who were selling them. And he pours out the coins of the money changers, and he knocks over their tables in fury. It's a wonderfully dramatic scene. Where is your gentle Jesus meek and mild now? As he charges through the court of the Gentiles where all this business was going like a bull charging through a china shop. Now for a lot of Christians, this ag disruptive, aggressive behavior of Jesus doesn't mesh too well with our cherished views of Jesus as a teacher, as a leader, a comforter, a gentle shepherd. For a lot of Christians, they have difficulty picturing Jesus so confrontational. But Jesus wanted folk to come to the temple, to enjoy the temple, and to gain benefits and blessings from their experiences of just being there in those sacred walls. And our Lord was angry, he was furious, because there in front of him, in that sacred place, were those who were using religion as a means of extorting money from ordinary folk who could bear afford it. Jesus was lashing out against the abuses of the temple system, the outrageous markups and the tariffs that the pilgrims to Jerusalem had to pay to the money changers. And scholars reckon that more than 
two million people converged on the holy city at the annual Passover festival. They came from every part of the Jewish diaspora to be there for the Passover. And in order to pay the required temple tax, people had to convert their Roman and Greek pagan currency into the religiously correct coinage with no image of the emperor stamped upon it. And for the sacrifices, most people purchased unblemished animals from the temple markets, doves, sheep, cattle, a range of animals for a whole range of budgets. Most could only afford the cheapest option. A dove that cost £1.50 pence on the streets of Jerusalem cost £15 pounds in the temple market. And these were expensive burdens for the mostly impoverished faithful. Folk who'd sacrifice mightily to travel from all corners of the Roman Empire to the holy city. And all of this seems worthy of Jesus' scorn and anger and stunning response. Whipping, throwing out, upturning. But is this really what the cleansing of the temple is all about? Something is rotten and rotten to the core. The, the source of the stench is worse and even more stomach-drenching than the abuse of the system. It's the system itself. What's going on in the temple, a building which was central to the Jewish faith, is rotten, and both the religious leaders and their followers pulse around it in an established, protected, and unreflective pattern of hierarchy, control, and certainty. The meaning of God in folks' lives, the eternal, the divine, had been reduced to sacrificial bureaucracy. The God who proclaimed to the Hebrew folk years before at Mount Sinai that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The God who spoke the Ten Commandments of freedom and love. The God of steadfastness and long-suffering and mercy was now distorted, reduced to this, an annual monetary transaction. A dove, a lamb, a pigeon, a calf. Sacrifice for what? To honor God? To appease God and get him on your side? Jerusalem is a giant beehive of frenzied activity. Yet at the very center of this religious city is decay and rot and it stinks. And Jesus does something about it. And perhaps because the smell is so bad, no one can recognize the very image of God in their midst. At least not the religious authorities and those with the greatest stake in the corrupt religious system. And it is into this corruption that God sends his son Jesus, into the very heart of it all, the temple in Jerusalem, to begin a process of renewal and transformation, to create in the whipping and the turning out and the overturning a true hope for a broken people and a broken world. He cleanses the temple quite simply to expose and rid the world of that something that is rotten in the state of Denmark. Jesus, in this one defining moment, has cut open the religious system and what is revealed is not good. When religion is about control and narrowing God and restricting God, watch out for the rot. When appearances trump substance, watch out. When more and more million pound houses are being built while the number of homeless people in the country increases, watch out. When the Lord's table is restricted to those in good standing, watch out. When a high rise goes up in flames and the shocking reality of its poverty is revealed, watch out. When multi-million pound businesses thrive on avoiding paying corporation tax and income tax and on accounting schemes that are deceitful and those in authority do nothing about it, watch out. When the most powerful country in the world defines itself in terms of guns and enemies and threats, watch out. When chief executive officers typically earn more than 300 times, 300 times the pay of average workers and more than 700 times the pay of minimum wage earners, watch out. When scripture, when the Bible is used to incite hatred and create division, 
watch out. Something is rotten in Denmark. Will we let Jesus into these temples? For, let's face it, so often you and I are quiescent and accepting the status quo. We are so formed by our own families, values, and the communities that we're part of that we just simply accept the way our world operates as being the norm. We don't question it. I love the story of a mother who cooks a roast with her son before he goes off to university. And she shows him how they have to cut the end off the roast before they put it in the oven. And the son asks why they cut off the end, and his mum's response is that it's the way her mother taught her. So they phone his granny, and his response is the same. And eventually the boy's great granny is asked the question, why do we cut off the end of the roast before we put it in the oven? And great granny replied, because the pan I used was too small for the roast. The reason had been unclear, and generations had been repeatedly performing an unnecessary act. Many of us tend to respect what we've received as tradition. Many also tend to be polite and not want to create conflict by questioning unless, unless we're in a position of authority to do so. As a result, as a result, it takes somebody like Jesus to come along and to see how very wrong the situation has become and to be willing to point it out on the risk of becoming very unpopular doing something about it. Would Jesus use his whip of cords in the church? Is our institution too set on perpetuating itself at the cost of true discipleship? In what ways do you and I need to change what we can't see because we're so much part of the problem? What is our version of making God's house into a house of commerce? Will you and I be willing to lose control and look through beautiful facades to see and encounter the God who's been made known to us in Jesus, the God who blesses community over accomplishments, substance over surface, risk over safety, and self-giving over self-preservation? Now, these are urgent questions that the gospel presents to us as individuals, as a community of faith here at St. Nicholas, as a nation, as a world. Now, my hope and prayer is that all of us here together in this congregation will proclaim that God is not just love, but a whip that drives out control and arrogance and systems and limits. We belong to one disruptive Lord. And this Lord of ours is bent on overturning anything and everything that hinders his human family from getting the best that the world can offer. Everything that prevents them from appropriate devotion and service to God and to each other. To put it crudely, friends, our God is peeved at the way our society and the church organize themselves and people are denied that abundant life which Jesus came to bring and he has every right to be. As we contemplate the future of the church here in Presswick, let us ensure that here in St. Nicholas, let's ensure that we have a place where Jesus will be very happy to worship each returning Sunday, that here that within these walls there is love and friendship and acceptance all offered to all who enter these doors, that everything we do within these walls leads people to the living God, that our prayers, that our music, and all that we share will help to spread the gospel of Christ's redeeming grace, and that this house of prayer, built 113 years ago, may continue to flourish and grow Indeed, to be a house of prayer for all people. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all honour and glory as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Life is sweet, gracious God. So precious are our days, even in this time of lockdown. We give you thanks that we can enjoy a good book, watch our favourite programme on television, listen to the radio, FaceTime a family member, go for a stroll, the wind in our faces, refreshing and invigorating. We give thanks for our marvellous National Health Service, 
with its hosts of surgeons and doctors, nurses and therapists, and all those folk who maintain our hospitals and clinics, those who hold our hand and use their skills to bring health restored and strength renewed. We give thanks for our communities, the places where we live and the folks who are our neighbours and our friends. And we praise you for this attractive borough with all its attendant delights to fill our days. Our gratitude is endless, Heavenly Father, and above all for the gift of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the one who brings the light and the love of heaven to our lives, the one who reigned from a cross that one day we might reign from a throne. And now, Lord, in these quiet moments, we bring our concerns to you. We pray for this congregation here, ever eager to give of our best to you and to the parish in which we are set. We thank you this day for the heritage that is ours, for the inheritance which, in which we are set. And we pray for all the congregations in the town, for Kincase Parish Church, for Prestwick South Parish Church, for Moncton and Prestwick North Parish Church, for St. Ninian's Episcopal Church, for St. Quivix Roman Catholic Church, for the New Life Church, for the Bethany Hall, each one an outpost of heaven, striving to make God's kingdom a reality in this town. For a world filled with darkness, hate, greed and tragedy, we make our prayer. May governments and peoples work to bring light and love, sharing and peace to all peoples. For those in special need today, we make our prayer. Those anxious about their health or the health of a loved one, those who've laid a loved one to rest in these past days. Those who are feeling isolated and lonely. Those who are struggling with depression. Those for whom sleep is difficult. For those who are abused. Those estranged from a family member. In the silence of our hearts, we name them now. And recalling the faces of those we hold dear who've passed through the veil of death, we give you praise for all who made our lives so rich and so full, who are now safe on that further shore. We miss them every day, Lord, as we whisper their names now, in the knowledge that they are not far away, but with you until that glorious day of reunion in the Father's house. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, whose sacred words we now take upon our lips as his family, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing praise in CH3, hymn number 482, Yield Not to Temptation, for Yielding is Sin.
Inspired by your holy word, great God, may we go forth from here to bring sweetness and light, love and peace into a world so tired, so bleeding, that others may come to know you, the true God and Father of us all. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and all those whom you love, both near and far, this day and forevermore. Amen.